Welcome back to Podcast Recovery, everyone. We are your hosts, David O. And Eric V. Today we're joined by our special guest, Chase. How are you doing, man? Good, how are you guys? Doing good. well, man. Doing well. It's kind of cold today, but uh, otherwise pretty good. Where are you guys right now? Uh, we're just south of Baltimore. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Where are you, yeah. where are you from, Chase? I'm I'm from California. I'm from uh, Berkeley, California. So the oh Berkeley nice, area. yeah, yeah. Um, it's like it's great weather there. Yeah, usually around this time it's 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 pretty good. I'm I'm currently traveling right now. Actually, I'm I'm in well I'm in quarantine of course. Um, I'm in Lyon, France, supposedly studying French. But um, oh cool. <laughs> How's that I'm going? In quarantine right now. It was going extremely well. Um, until like the quarantine started, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm in I'm, I'm in lockdown here. Hopefully, um, can we get back to the U.S. in in about three months or so if everything goes well? If I can get back in, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I'm a native Californian. So awesome. Uh, so when were you first introduced to recovery? Um, so for me, it was the spring of 2014. Mm-hmm. Um. I was basically coming off of a. It was my it was my my junior year of college, um, and mm-hmm. I was basically coming off of kind of a complete breakdown. Mm-hmm. Um, it college will do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it was bad. Um, I had basically ruined things with my ex girlfriend. Uh, long story short, ruined things with my ex girlfriend. Was drinking a ton. This was kind of the peak of my kind of my all-time all-time yeah it was my all-time peak of drinking i would say um which is not terribly uncommon in university no. but i mean like i yeah but i mean i completely self-destructed and was drinking a ton was being just the worst boyfriend uh known to mankind in this relationship the final straw was i got very drunk um one night I cheated and about two weeks after that told her about it, also drunk at the time. Um, and actually no, it was about a month it was about a month later that I that I told her about this. And mm-hmm. that was the straw that broke the camel's back in our relationship and that's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back in kind of my life at that point. Um because mm-hmm. it was a complete self destruction and you know, that relationship fell apart and it was really tough. Um, and at that point, that's, that's kind of the first time that I flirted, so to speak, with, with um, stopping, stopping drinking and sobriety. Uh-huh. So at that point, I went home, back to Berkeley. I, was, I, w- I went to college and a school in Texas. I flew home and was kind of you know, trying to like put things back together and ended up um, going to some meetings and meeting some people. And it's the first time I kind of um, dove, I, I wouldn't say I dove into this world, I, I think, <laughs> but I was, you know, I was mm-hmm. uh, dipping, dipping my toes into the water, trying yep. to share other people's stories and meet people, um, see about how I could help myself. Um, cause this was kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of me realizing that I, I, I had a problem and that I wasn't yeah. somebody that dealt with alcohol well. So mm-hmm. that was my first, that was when I was introduced to recovery. And mm-hmm. for that summer, I went to several meetings, um, met a, yeah, you know, I met a bunch of people, um, was not drinking at the time and it helped me out a lot to get through that, mm-hmm. went back went back to university my senior year and of course started to tell people, yeah, you know, like I'm not drinking right now. Like I had a really rough summer. Everybody knew that I had fucked up really bad. Um, yeah. all my friends, they, they, they knew that I was like suffering. Um, so they could see what I was doing. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not drinking right now, blah, blah, blah. And that, asked, that, that lasted for like a couple of weeks, right. To be, to be quite yeah. honest, because this is my last, this is my senior year of college. And how, much, in, how much sobriety did you like put together? Like how much time? I would say at that time, probably, probably a solid like two months. 
I would say from maybe maybe June to August. Um, I think, actually, I, sh- I shouldn't say that because I think 4th of July I was drinking. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then, but yeah, so that was that was extremely helpful, healthy for me. And that's one of the first, that's kind of the longest I had gone um, being in the college environment, not not drinking and really seeing the, the benefits of, of sobriety at that point, both physical and mental. But again, again, went back from my senior year and eventually very slowly accelerated back to back to where I, I kind of was. Um, no, okay, not, not as bad as I was the year before, but, you know, I was drinking like everybody else. I was kind of like my normal drinking crazy, you know, um, like bad habits. Um, but again, like not terribly uncommon for that environment in that world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then after I graduated, um, you know, started working for the first time, um, doing, you know, in the professional world, so to speak, being an adult and was not drinking as much as I was in college. Right. But mm-hmm. still, you know, every, every weekend, every, every other weekend, been drinking, getting very, very drunk and very slowly, probably three or three or four years later, um, mm-hmm. bringing us up to, to now, uh, realizing that this level, this level of binge drinking was just completely unsustainable. It was actually, even though I thought it was pretty normal, it was actually kind of ruining me because, uh, I mean, just dealing with, for me, like I, I, I'm a lightweight, I don't deal with alcohol well. So if I mm-hmm. binge drink on a weekend, I'm going to be drunk for about a week. I'm, excuse me. I'm going to be hungover for about a week after that. And I'm probably going to fall off a complete cliff mentally and physically. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So that, you know, that's, so I, you know, I'm just bas- basically kind of calculating how much I was drinking and its effects on me. Like, you know, if, if I'm doing that 10 weekends out of a year, which is not even, which I was doing a lot more than that, but if I'm doing that 10 weeks out of a year, that's, you know, a fifth of my, my year, a fifth of my life that I'm not a hundred percent that I'm suffering. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was drinking a lot more than that. Right. Um, probably important to say that like I'm, I'm also somebody who struggles with mental illness, depression, anxiety, blah, 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 blah. Um, have like a, I don't know, you can call it run of the mill, the anxiety, anxiety and depression. So to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't consider myself unique in that regard at all, but, um, it's pretty clear to me now the negative relationship between alcohol and mental illness for people who are more inclined to falling off emotional cliffs every once in a while. Yeah. Um, so that kind of brings us up to October of 2019, which is what, mm-hmm. seven months ago. And after many, many years of knowing that I needed to make some changes that this is not sustainable, but not really knowing how to do it and being scared to do so, I decided I was going to make some drastic changes, um, cut back almost entirely. And now I am moderating, you could say. And, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I've completely, I I guess we'll get into that in a little bit, but I, I'm my, I mean, it's been, my life has not, I would, I wouldn't say, um, like a complete 180, but it's me from me now compared to where I was like two years ago is the changes are amazing. Like the, the positive, the positive changes have been just absolutely immense and I'm doing so much better. I have so much more energy. I'm so much more productive and happy and stable. And yeah, and I, I, I think I'm kind of just on the beginning of this, this journey, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the changes have been amazing. So yeah, that's why I wanted to, to, I guess, talk to you guys today. Awesome. Well, uh, we're, we're now going to turn it over to you to uh, share your story with us. So take it away. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> I guess that's, that's kind of like the, that kind of sums up like the, 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 the tail the, end of it. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like the tail end of it. Um, I mean, we can, we can get into questions and, uh, you know, if that, if you think you'd like to go down that road and just kind of have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, 
that's kind of the the basic like structure. That's the basic trajectory of of kind of my story. Cool. Um, cool. And so yeah, I, I mean, I guess yeah. Go ahead. So um, I have a question for you, Chase. Uh, so mm-hmm. with with moderation, um, it's I guess moderation would be kind of in the recovery world, like kind of the the sibling of uh, harm reduction, um, mm-hmm. where where they're very related, um, but they're not quite the same. So in other fellowships that I know about, such as um, you know, we've talked to people who are in I don't know if it's SA or SLA, but one of the sex fellowships, as well as um, mm-hmm. overeaters they have kind of a bottom line, right? And I think it's a very cool mm-hmm. concept, and I, I feel like moderation probably has a similar concept um, as well. So what, for you, what, what's your bottom line where, or do you have a bottom line where if you go over this limit, you might have to do like a reassessment of where you are? Yeah, right. So I, basically like my, my rule for myself right now is if I do decide to consume alcohol, I can't go over three drinks. Okay. Um, okay. And that's been effective because I'm, and again, like I'm, I've, I'm, I'm sorry, I've started to get into kind of the, the literature and the different um, ideas that are out there, but I don't consider myself um, particularly, particularly somebody who, is an alcoholic because I don't think I was ever dependent on alcohol. I'm not somebody who was drinking every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was, I'm, I, but I consider my story very, very, very common because I'm kind of your, your everyday binge drinker, which people mm-hmm. are doing millions and millions and millions of people are doing out there. Um, and I think it's like, I think it's a massive problem that a lot of people are not talking about. So I, for me right now, as, as I understand it, I, I feel like um, there's millions of people out there who might not identify as alcoholics per se because they're not. And you guys can totally correct me if I'm wrong, but people who are not drinking every day who don't consider themselves dependent on alcohol but still have major alcohol problems because it's causing so much destruction and mm-hmm. suffering in their lives. So yeah, totally. Yeah, so me just drinking three drinks right now has, has been effective. Um, because again, I'm, I'm somebody who was still, you know, like maybe one or two occasions a month where I'm, I'm actually, it's like an opportunity to opportunity to drink. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing right now. And it's been, it's been, it's been good. I mean, again, like it's such a, it's such a contrast from where I was even last year, even a year, a year ago that it's, it's been, it's been really encouraging, but I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that like, if I, if I ever get into a place where, I start binge drinking again, like I'm going to have to just cut myself off completely because I, I definitely know I can't go back to that. I can't go back to where I was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, so right. from like what I understand, um, you know, binge drinking is a form of alcoholism, not just the, the every day. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I don't know some of the forms of alcoholism. Uh, I can't really subscribe. I, I know when I was at, um, FMA for rehab. I don't think it's called FMA anymore. But when I was at FMA, the uh, they they classified it as four types of alcoholics. And the last one, I was really not too keen on. I thought it was a little ridiculous. The first three, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I can get down with these. The, that third one, I was like, eh, you're pushing it a little bit with like your definition oh, here. I, um, I think it was having like one drink a day. Where I, I mean, I can buy into it because it's like the habit, um, but, but yeah. it's like, what's that's the like intention? A habitual drinker. Yeah, it's it's a little bit different. That's, like you that's really. A, that's go, not necessary. I no. That's I, not necessarily like alcoholically, you know. Well, yes, yes. The the binge drinking and then like you know your daily drinkers like you're. I mean you're you know you're hiding it in different parts of the house like, I don't know. Yeah. You, you open like the the like uh, I don't know. Like the cat transporter, um, the cat, like the kitty, like, you know, you're taking your cat to the vet and there's a vodka bottle in there. Might, you might have a problem. Yeah. But um, I guess, so you're saying like, you know, if you, if you go beyond this limit, you'll, you'll kind of like reassess and look at an abstinence based 
method if like you take it too far like that's not like those cards aren't off the table but like the cards to go out and have a good time aren't off the table either or not have a good time but go out and have a drink yeah no i i think that's i think that's a good, a good description of it i mean i've what i what i've noticed is that my my drinking has been steadily trending down mm-hmm. um which is great like for example i'm not i'm not um like right now in, in quarantine, like there's, there's opportunities to, to drink, have like a beer or two at dinner. Mm-hmm. Right. And in those situations, I've been like, no, I actually don't need that because that's going to fuck up my sleep and I can just drink seltzer water and be fine. Um, and there's, I've also had a lot of situations where I've gone out and like at a bar or whatever, um, well before the quarantine and was like, I obviously had the option to drink. And I was just like, you know, I, I don't think I, I, I want to, and I need to, and just didn't. Um, so seeing, seeing those changes and how I'm, I'm steadily trending down has been really encouraging. So I hope to continue to do that. But like you said, exactly. Like if, if I, if something happens in my life and I, and I go back to where I was a year ago, two years ago, I, I'm really going to need, like, I, I, I do not want to do that. And I, yeah. I think at that point I would definitely like reassess. Um, yeah, because honestly, like like you said, I'm kind of at the, the beginning of my learning about this stuff and, and kind of at the beginning of my, my journey here. So, yeah, mm-hmm. the progress has been great, but I, I'm realizing that, you know, things can change. Um, people are not perfect. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to continue, like, on, like, like a, a positive track, and hopefully things continue to, to go well. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh so I have a question. Like you, you talked a, uh, a lot about, um, well, not a lot about, but you, you mentioned like the physical dependence and like, I was kind of curious. Um, cause I, I think it, like there's a lot of different opinions on to like what people define as addiction. So is, is addiction to you like strictly a physical dependence or is it also like a psychological, um, relationship or mental obsession with uh the substance yeah that's that's a really good question actually like i (laughs) i don't even know if i can answer that because i before i think before i i started i set out to learn um you know on my i guess journey of moderation you could call it i thought i knew i thought i was clear about what addiction was Mm -hmm. and the more the more that i like i read about it um the more i I'm kind of confused, right? Because there's so many different, different yeah. opinions out there. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I read, for example, one of the first books that I read was, um, Alan Carr, um, the easy way to control alcohol. Uh-huh. And he, um, he kind of dismisses addiction <laughs> in a lot of ways, like, um, addiction, to, yeah. Addiction to alcohol, for example, he kind of he kind of says that it's something that's based more on like social conditioning, and yeah, you know, basically in, in 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 the person's mind, right? And he obviously he's he's extremely effective in getting people to stop drinking because he brings up all the reasons why you shouldn't drink, and I think he's completely um, he has a really strong voice there. But mm-hmm. he, yeah, I mean. It, saying that there's no medical or scientific basis in addiction, that to me was what went against like what I had kind of known before that. Yeah. Um, because I thought, I thought addiction to be something, addiction to alcohol to be, yeah, something that was something that was chemical and something that was equally mental and physical. I didn't know much about it. Right. And I still don't yeah. know really much about it. Um, but actually now after reading like the research that's out there, I'm even more kind of like, I, I don't know. Like I'm, it's, it, it's, it's tough to say. Um, yeah, and you guys probably have are, have read a, a more way more well read than I am on on the topic. Um, so I'm actually yeah, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm interested in seeing what what you guys have to say about that. But like for for me right now, like I yeah I, yeah I'll leave it at that. I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> um, my thought is uh, it, it, it's kind of a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Um, because it, like, if you look at it scientifically and, and you look at the, uh, the dopamine receptors and our serotonin receptors 
and, and norepinephrine, all those like quote unquote happy chemicals that our, our brains um, produce. A, a, a lot of the things we do, and it's not, and it's not always substances. A, a lot of things we do, like behavioral, uh, produce those things, uh, sex, gambling. So, that, like those aren't those aren't substance related addictions. So, there's not necessarily a physical dependence there. But when you, like I said, when you look at it scientifically, our brains are becoming used to those serotonin and dopamine hits. Like you, 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 you hit that number on the roulette wheel and, and those, those lights start firing in your brain. Like you, uh, are, are using sex for however people use sex for, um, you're still getting those happy chemicals. And when it comes to, uh, substances, um, e even on, on, on the low end, sugar and caffeine will produce those same amounts of things. And then you start going higher with uh, nicotine and then alcohol and then THC and then all sorts of stimulants and, and opioids. And, and they're all sort of playing with our, our brain chemistry. So there, there's, and uh, eventually um, it, it, it's going to have an effect whether, uh, whether just strictly psychological or, or actually physical. So like I said, uh, it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. And one of the best ways I've heard, heard it, like if you, if you take a hundred people and, and you put them on like a, a strict diet of alcohol for 30 days, at the end of those 30 days, like a, a certain percentage, like a, 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 just for round numbers sake, we'll say 25% of those people are going to be alcoholics at the end of that month. Now, if you do that same thing with heroin or opioids, a drastically high number of those people are going to come out addicted to opioids or addicted to heroin. So it, 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 it depends on the substance. It depends on the person. Um, but yeah, there's definitely psychological and physical aspects to addiction. So it's not always necessarily like you drink so much that like you can have the shakes the next morning and have to have it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely some psychological, uh, mental obsessive like pieces to it. Cause I know like when I was in active addiction, I was obsessed with fucking drugs. My thinking was all about it all the time. Like how I can, how I can continue that and what substances I need to, to do that. Yeah. What about you, Eric? Are we talking about the disease model, right? Is that kind of what we're, we're talking about here? Uh, well, yeah. Like what is addiction? Is it, is it strictly a physical dependence or is it a, a psychological, uh, mental obsession as well? Um, so I, I actually have a very formed opinion on this. Um, Ooh, good. it's, uh, shocker, I, Eric. <laughs> Uh, I hate the disease model. I hate it. I, I, I absolutely hate it's because it, it's not a disease. It's an illness. And there is a clear distinction between mm. the two. There is. There's a distinction you're between. Saying, you're, saying and it's, you're, you're saying it's an illness, not a disease. Yes. A disease, okay. a disease, is, something, I just, I just, a disease yeah. is something that can be cured. An illness is something that needs to be managed. So by calling it the disease what? model, okay. Okay. look up a definition. Look up a definition yeah. of the words because we, we throw yeah, no, the words you around. Your sentence, I was on board. Yeah, we throw the words around pretty loosely. But like uh, one of the ways that people talk about like, you know, you're comparing it to cancer. And it's like, no, we're not. Cancer can be cured. Like, you know, um, mental illness such as addiction cannot. It can be managed. Yeah. But it can't be cured. Um, so, so diabetes, so diabetes is, is an illness, not a disease. Can it be cured? No. So no. I, yeah, I mean, um, so, I mean, it's a different type of illness, but I, I think addiction is a mental mm -hmm. illness. So I, I put it in the category of depression, uh, anxiety, um, ADHD. I just don't, I don't put it on the same lines as like, you know, I have a staph infection, right? Like it's, yeah. it's not the same, but it doesn't mean it's not any no. less in, like important. Um, absolutely. But I mean, that's just my opinion. Like I, I think use words yeah. words are very important and if you misuse them yes. um i think it can turn people off so i i mean mm -hmm. it's a mental illness 
Like comparing, mm-hmm. like sure, the severity can be, you know, just as dire as you know yeah, a severe disease, but so can like being depressed. Like how many people die from suicide? So I mean, yeah. I don't know. I I think there's a distinction that needs to. Uh, Elliot, don't don't do that. Um, that needs to be kind of. Um, I don't know. That's just my opinion. I I don't know. I know a lot of people okay. will disagree with me on that, but no, I mean uh, it, uh, it's uh, it, it's chronic. So so it, it's something that it, it's 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 very difficult because you know, like there's so many. It's it's not like other diseases, like you said. It's not like cancer. It's not like tuberculosis. It's not like but it's a it's a mental it's a mental illness but it's a a mental illness it's a mental illness i mean you're not you're not going into a doctor and getting an ultrasound and they're like oh found some addiction in your lungs like no that's fucking (laughs) ridiculous it's in it's a fucking brain disease like it's a brain illness right like Mm -hmm. any other uh mental illness you know, and when people are like, what doctor do you see if you have addiction? You see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. You don't see, mm-hmm. like, your primary care doctor. You see a counselor, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. One, yeah, just reflecting on that, one thing that I was, when I was, you know, kind of just in my normal drinking day, that I was very conscious of that now is completely different is how much, how much alcohol was, like, constantly on my mind and how much it influenced my life and like how I planned out my life. Like I would, um, I would mark down on the calendars, like my, my nights, the days that I would be drinking, like nights I would be going out. Right. Ah, and every, yeah. yeah. And like everything would be kind of like revolved around, around that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. and so even if I was only drinking one or two nights a month, like I would be looking forward to those dates when they would come, I would be super like anxious about it, like wanting everything to be perfect. Um, like couldn't, you know, thinking about all day, like, I can't wait to start drinking, blah, 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 blah. And just like all of like the, like very irritable just because of the idea that I would be drinking, like knowing that I was probably going to do something that was going to be really harmful to me, but also kind of excited about it. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. and that that, that has completely shifted in my life now. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm calm in all these, like these moments where these like drinking occasions, like I'm just, I go into it just like calm, relaxed. Um, I know I don't have to drink. I know, if, um, you know, I, I, I do have a drink that I'm, I'm going to hopefully be able to, um, to like, I've been successful now in, in stopping mm-hmm. and just stopping at three and just like being, that's it being like, that's it. Um, mm-hmm. but I think like my, basically my, my ideal, like my projection for myself is somebody who doesn't, doesn't need to drink, but if, who finds himself on like on a beach in Mexico someday and somebody comes by like selling Corona's. Oh, I got, I brought up Corona again. Sorry. It's on the, it's on the uh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the elephant in the room. It's everywhere. <laughs> it's in France too. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah. Right in there. Um, but if there's like, I could like drink a beer on the beach or if I'm, if I'm somewhere and I'm having a nice meal, I could like have a glass of wine. And that's like the ideal. Like hopefully I could get there. I can do that. Um, mm-hmm. I, if I, but again, like you guys said, if like I slip up and I and I, I go back to where I was, then I'm gonna have to make some some uh, some more changes and probably have to go um, alcohol free. Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah, but, and one thing I've also been really interested in is kind of and puzzled by is kind of the different the difference between like who is an alcoholic and not an al- non alcoholic because there's a lot of people who. Um, don't identify as alcoholics, but still probably have a huge problem with the drinking. And obviously, there's a lot of people out there who identify as alcoholics. And I've I've understood alcoholics at right now as being somebody who is dependent on alcohol, mm-hmm. uh, maybe perhaps drinking every day. And I never thought that that was me. But yeah, like yeah, I mean, there's so many different opinions out there. It's kind of hard to it's hard to know kind of where you stand or like what like label you should put, you know, put on your, put on your tap, your chest or whatever. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eric, Eric, can I follow up? Go ahead, David. You may. 
Okay. I, I grant you permission. Um, thank you, sir. Um, so I, I'm really glad you, you, you touched on that, Chase, because um, nobody can tell you whether you're an alcoholic or not. So I'm really glad, and it's really relieving that you you've really taken the time and the effort to re- like really begin your education, and and honestly come to your own decision as to like whether you are an alcoholic or not. Because like we've heard lots of stories, and, and like some people, it's like you're you're drinking nail polish remover because you can't get to the liquor store. Yeah, you got a fucking problem. You're not like that. So you sort of have, you know, like you're in a little bit of a gray area and that's where I'm like I'm going with like my next like question really. So, um, what do you think? <sighs> hmm. Do you, do you think there's an inherent greater difficulty in moderation as opposed to strict abstinence? Because I feel like there's a lot more work, like not necessarily more work involved, but different work involved. And it's not quite as publicized or uh, um, widespread. So I I think you you personally are probably doing a lot more of the legwork um, to really seek out um, those, uh, I, I guess, recovery tools, uh, for moderation. So, so do you think moderation is slightly more difficult in, in a form of recovery than strict abstinence? Um, yeah, I, hmm. that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's tough to say, cause yeah. like, they, I'm not saying like, like abstinence is easy, but you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think, I think, one thing that's what one part of like the work and one of the difficulties that I've seen so far is that um, if, if you have one or if you have a drink, it's always going to be for your, like your friends and the people who around you. It's always going to be like, Oh, we'll have another drink. We'll have another drink. You can have another, right? You yeah. only had one. You just keep going. Yeah. Um, that that's definitely, that's definitely a thing. And they don't understand a lot of people who are around you don't understand, um, just stopping at one or two. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, was somebody, I was somebody before who couldn't understand somebody who wanted to do that. Yeah. Um, so that, that potentially is, is more difficult than just saying, yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I don't drink and I'm, and I'm done and you're not going to get me to drink ever. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely a, a strong point there. Um, yeah, but I'm, I, again, I think, um, I think like my projection of, of hopefully the kind of person that I w- could be, or, cause I think there's people out there who are like that, right? There's, there's people who just, they don't even, they don't even think about, they don't even think about alcohol. They have really no issue with it. If they have like a, a a couple of wines at dinner, they're fine. Um, if they have a beer on the beach, they're fine. And I'm hoping that I, I could be that. If I, if I find out six months from now, a year from now, if I find out I'm not that, like, because I'm, I'm starting to continue to want to like get drunk. Um, mm-hmm. and my crate, I still have cravings for alcohol and all this, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to, I think I will understand that. Okay. That's never going to be me. Um, maybe it's time to, maybe it's time to, completely embrace, um, alcohol free. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, because I mean, yeah, I mean, something that I've been very, been very clear about, um, is that there's no, there's no real benefit, so to speak to, to drinking. Right. Um, mm-hmm. you have, you have, for me, like I have one drink, I have two drinks, you know, it like, it's warm in your stomach. It makes you, it makes you feel kind of, kind of, kind of calm, right? Um, it's like a social lubricant, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, you, you can you can be in a social situation. Um, most people out there, if they if they actually try it and not and not drink alcohol and not be drunk, and it's actually yeah. from, it's been super liberating to be in social situations and be completely completely sober. Um, that's been amazing and super super like exhilarating and impactful. Um, so that's something that I, I definitely, I definitely have in mind. Um, 
Yeah. So I get, does that, that, does that kind of answer your question? Like I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm hoping that I can be this person. If I find out that I can't, I'll, I'll need, I'll know, I'll then know that, yeah, um, I need to, I need to, I need to make a change, another change. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that totally answers it. Yeah. Uh, All right, Eric. So, all right. So you're in France right now. How, how long have you been in France? for just this semester or since the beginning of the year? I've been here, I've been here for five months now. Five months. Since uh, November, yeah. Okay, so you started this kind of process in October. Has there been any yeah. issues as far as, you know, adjusting to, like, lifestyle differences and cultural differences in France? Or would you say it's almost easier I was to just thinking that. do this moderation program, um, like go like this moderation route right now, because maybe I know you're studying French, but, uh, and I don't know what level you're like linguistically you are, um, how fluent, but you know, is there, do you think it's easier being in another country to kind of go about this or, you know, how would you, um, kind of rate this process? Like as far as like how difficult it is being in a new place, trying this. Yeah, I, I think it was a lot easier because I came here and I didn't know anybody and I was like going to be, I was studying in a, in a school. So the people who I was meeting are, you know, the people, are people I'm meeting for the first time. So they don't, they don't know me. They don't know about my drinking history. And I could just tell them, you know, I could even tell them, oh, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, tonight I'm not going to drink. And oh yeah, I don't really drink much. I, I'm only going to drink one and they wouldn't question it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it would be so much more difficult to be in a place that you've been a long in a long time have your friends um who already know you have seen you you know in all situations and suddenly try to change those relationships and be like yeah actually guys i'm not i'm not drinking anymore i think that would be a huge huge challenge and i think that's something that's probably keeping a lot of people from from um trying to trying to go sober that like that fear of of what will my friends say um, I think it's been definitely easier to, to like change, change scenery. And that was just, you know, circumstantial. Like I got, I guess I got lucky there. Um, and then I think, yeah, like I said, cause I, I understand, I understand alcohol consumption and consumption as just as something that's not healthy and, and, in, in any amount, it's, it's like a, it's a risk you're taking. Um, if you, if you drink alcohol, so I don't think there's such thing as like a healthy drinking culture. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that French people do drink differently than Americans, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Like they, they're a lot more. They go about it a lot more calmly, more slowly. It's they're a little bit more formal in that um, they're not playing beer pong. They're not. They're not doing shotguns. They're not doing beer bombs. They're not drinking with like the velocity that we drink with. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, in that sense too, it's it's also been easier to be to be in, in kind of this culture. I would say. Mm. All right. All right. Um, I kind of want to go back to, like, you didn't talk about this, but I want to, like, delve into, like, the beginning of your story a little bit more. So when did you, when did you start drinking, and then when did you notice that your drinking had started to uh, progress and then become more and more problematic? Um, yeah, so I started, um, I would say I took my first real drink when I was 16. Mm -hmm. Wait, 16? Yeah, 16. So this was the summer after my sophomore year of high school. Okay. And I was very not a big drinker in high school. Um, mm -hmm. did, yeah, I consider myself very like a late bloomer. And that, yeah. that, like, um, drinking very occasionally at parties. Like I got drunk on a, a, a few occasions, but just wasn't really into it, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, and then I, you know, I 18 left, went, went to college. Mm -hmm. um, did, some other, did some other stuff. And that's when I, I really accelerated, obviously, mm -hmm. especially in college. So that's, that's when I got to, you know, that's when I really started binge drinking at a, at a, um, um, on a constant basis. And mm -hmm. I pretty much continued, um, up until six months ago, I would say 
obviously, obviously after college, like everyone, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, they, they decline a little bit in like their drinking habits. Um, yeah. Frequency. So I think I was pretty normal in that, in that, in that sense. Um, mm-hmm. But still, you know, maybe once or twice a month, just getting absolutely fucking hammered and yeah, you know, <laughs> just, you know, you know, throwing up terrible hangover, complete self, complete self-destruction. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's kind of, I think that's kind of my, my, my point is that I, I feel like there's, cause I, I, I don't think there's anything abnormal, I, abnormal about kind of my drinking story. Right. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a very typical story. Yeah. I feel. And I think there's so many people out there who are very similar to me in, in their relationship with alcohol and mm-hmm. just never even consider it and never even think about it and just think that it's so normal because it is so normal. Um, yeah. And nobody, nobody around me thought that I was had, a, had an issue or thought that I was like hurting myself or thought that I was having a hard time with my alcohol consumption. And yeah. I think there's just millions and millions of people especially people in like 20 somethings who are going through the same thing and who are not even having these conversations or not even, um, not even looking at their behavior and are really, 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 really suffering and really, really struggling. So yeah, yeah it's actually, it's kind of terrifying to think about the, the amount yeah. of people who are going through something probably really similar. Yeah, no. And I, I really, I really commend you and, and have so much respect that like, you didn't have to go to those, those, those depths or those extremes to really start questioning y- your own behavior. Like, uh, cause like you said, like a lot of these 20 somethings are, are doing the same thing and then they get caught in the routine of that. Then they become 30 somethings doing the same thing and then 40 somethings and then their life completely falls apart. Their liver starts dying, their kidneys start dying and, 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 then they're in actual mortal danger. So like the fact that you're really educating yourself and, and practicing moderation and, and working that model, it's really fucking cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm trying. Um, (laughs) I mean, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to learn more. Um, I'm consider that I'm starting on a journey. I hope, I hope it goes well. Um, We'll see. <laughs> um, I'm only, you know, like six months in, so no, nothing is off. Nothing is off the table. I don't think. Um, no. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I the thing that the thing that's alarming has even been the changes that I've seen and kind of realizing how much my behavior has changed. Yeah. And just seeing how no, normalized like our horrible behaviors and relationships with alcohol are not only in oh, the yeah. US, but around, around the world. And it's, it's like, wow. Um, it's, it's scary yeah. what people are doing to themselves so often. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's rough. Back to you, Eric, with the weather. <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty cold out here, you know, and it's, it uh, rainy. Um, it is. So great. It's a little gray. 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 It's gray. I like gray though. Gray, gray's a good. Uh, it's a good shade. Um, so you make me sad. Um, do I? Do I make you sad? Uh, no, you don't. You're I, one of my I, best I, friends, and I, I love you, I, Eric. Aw, oh, sentiment. That's it's adorable. Um, <laughs> I. <laughs> Uh, so, okay. So here's, here's my question. You mentioned literature that you're reading, right? Um, and different things that you're, oh, you're going to steal my question. Uh, you know, it is what it is, but what are some, uh, what, (laughs) yes. What are some of the things that you've, um, read about recovery and, uh, addiction, um, mental health, uh, et cetera so far? And what currently is your favorite book, um, about the subject? Um, I just read, I, well, I've been reading also about, um, moderation cool. because I'm interested to see if that's something that's even, right. Something that's even possible. Something that's even, um, could even be like backed by science. Mm-hmm. So, um, I read, I recently, the, the, the book that I just finished reading, uh, 
was a book. Well, that, okay. That doesn't really get into the science so much. I think the, the, the most interesting book I've read about moderation was called drinking responsibly. And it's by this guy called Fred, Frederick Rogers. Hmm. Um, drinking, what is it called? Drinking, resp- responsible drinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was interesting because it, it, it kind of, it, it talks a lot about like the, the negative impacts of, of, of alcohol consumption. And it also gives like a strategies on how you can change your behaviors and, and things like that. Um, and that one, that book really talks a lot about the, the psychological impacts. And like you were talking about earlier, um, how, how it alters like dopamine levels, how if you binge drink, you're basically going to put yourself into a place where as you, as you recover from that, as you have a, as you have your hangover, you're actually experiencing like a, a withdrawal. And that's kind of like the, that's the fall off the emotional cliff that I was, I had always experienced. Um, so that book was, was pretty impactful for that. Um, I think for, I think, yeah, I think what I, the, the book that I mentioned earlier, the Alan Carr's book, that to me was, mm-hmm. was impactful just because his voice was so strong and he was just like, he was so convincing, you know, he was like, you know, you don't need, you don't need to drink. You don't need this. Um, it's bullshit. Um, everything that you've, 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 you've normalized in your behaviors is bullshit. Um, stop. Right. He doesn't get, I don't think he really gets so in depth into the science behind it, but mm-hmm. that's, that's been a pretty impactful book. Um, and then I'm going to, I'm hopefully starting, um, I think this is, Annie Grace's book, Alcohol, she has, cause she has a couple of books. Um, Alcoholics, no, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I downloaded Alcohol Explained by William Porter and I want to start getting into that one. And then the next on my list is, is Annie Grace's book. So yeah, I mean, do you guys have any recommendations for? Um, I haven't looked that much into moderation, so I'm sorry, but I don't. Hold on. Let me yeah. look real quick. I do have one. Oh. You're just Googling, Eric. You're no, you, don't, you don't have anything. You're just hitting Google. This isn't as much... Yeah, but I've been... I've- what? Oh, I found the book. Um, this isn't as much about um, moderation, but it's more about just habit and how to psychologically, I guess, change the way that, you know, change our behavior. Um, it's called The Power of Habit mm-hmm. by Charles Duhigg. But it's a cool book. And then mm-hmm. he has a follow-up as well. But mm. check it out. Power of habit. Okay. Um, I have a question right along those lines. Mm -hmm. So like when, when I think about like, um, moderation, I think it's very much a, a practice in self discipline. Um, and, and like, sort of like what I, what I talked about earlier, uh, with just sort of going the, the abstinence model, um, I, I think it's psychologically a, a little bit easier. It's like, oh, and it, cause it's kind of like a diet. If, if you kind of make that analogy a little bit, you're like, oh, I've, I have this going on with my body. I'm going to cut these things out. So I think that's, it, it's really easy to put those mental, uh, markers or, or barriers in place to not, to not cross. But with moderation, it, it, you're you, you're kind of going through a spectrum of behavior. It's not just all or nothing. So I, I really think self discipline is is uh, something that's uh, really at at the forefront and and a keystone to that. So um, 
what kind of, uh, have you looked into any like self discipline practices, like any, any sort of mindful meditation or, or, or anything like that, that really helps you, um, really train, train yourself to focus on your thinking and, and be able to remain vigilant on your thinking and your actions, your behaviors, and, uh, then ultimately your, your moderation. Yeah. Um, I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed very amateur, uh, Meta meditator? Is that uh, that's not a word, is it? Meta meditator. I, I like it. It, it is um, now. I'm a fan. Me- uh, I'm gonna use that. meta meditator. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a word now. Yeah, I I try to do that daily for mm-hmm. at least like five minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been doing that for probably like a year and a half. Um, nice. Now because it's. I was I was in therapy, um, not related, not particularly related to alcohol, but just general therapy, right? And yeah. this is something that the the therapist at the time kind of introduced me to. She introduced me to mindfulness mindfulness as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been doing that for like a year and a half, and again, super super novice. Like, just I don't I don't know I don't know anything, honestly. But even doing that five minutes a day has been just wildly impactful. I think for kind of, um, kind of, yeah, like training, training the, the mind and the body to, to be calm. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, it could be, I don't know, some kind of like placebo, but I, I kind of swear by it. And I, I find that I'm a lot less irritable yeah. uh, than I used to be a lot less anxious. And when I feel like it's just kind of like a tool that I've been able to use, like if ever I, I just, during the day I feel like shit. I yeah. can kind of go to that place and take like five minutes for myself to kind of get back to neutral and at least try. So, um, that's something I've been trying to, to, to learn more about as well. Um, mm-hmm. so that's, yeah, that's been, that's been a, a major thing. And, uh, um, I'm, I don't know, I guess I've, I guess I just, hmm. <laughs> I guess I, I come from um, a family of self disciplinists I guess you could kind of say <laughs> I don't okay. know. I think I've just always kind of had that had that gene, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. so I guess for me, having like a rule for myself, like I am not going to drink more than three drinks. Um, yeah, that, that has worked so far. But again, if that, yeah, if, if that, yeah, I think that's that's a really good question because if, if, if that becomes a struggle, if, right. Like if, if moderation becomes too much of a struggle, then I'll, I think I'll know that it's not worth it. Right. Mm-hmm. I think I'll know. Yeah. If it, like, like you were saying earlier, if it's so much work to keep me only at three drinks, then might as well not drink at all. Yeah. Right. And I'm definitely aware of that in, in, in the future. If, if I'm having to like, if I'm suffering to just keep it at three, then just quitting altogether makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Uh, but I, again, like I've, 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 I've observed people who are, you know, just the people out there who can have, have a drink at dinner or, and who can be at a bar and have a cocktail and that's it. They don't even think about alcohol. It's not something that, that has so much control over their lives. If, or even, I know they just don't my, it. my wife does that. And I, I don't, I, I've, I've never understood it. She's like, Oh yeah, I smoked pot twice. And I'm like, you mean like in an hour? She was like, no, ever. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. what do you mean? Yeah. And then she's like, yeah, I'll have, I'll have like two hard ciders over like a four hour period and, and be fine and go home. And it's like, what? Yeah. Why? That's not fun. No, but I, like, I, I actually sort of along those lines, I, I was thinking, uh, and this is a question for Eric, actually, because I think I did this too in my active, active addiction. I think there was a point where I was like trying to moderate different uses of different things at different times. And then ultimately I, I, I found out that I'm like, yeah, I can't do this. You're, you're asking me the did question. Did you do that as well, Eric? Um, well, did, so, you, did you do that as well? Like you're like, yeah. okay, I'm only going to do, do, do Coke on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, so 
I, I did I ever tell you about my <laughs> using is ridiculous. No, well, it's not ridiculous. It's you know you try it, and if it if it fails, then you know maybe it becomes ridiculous. I yeah because I don't because then the line blurs. You're gonna be like, no, I'm gonna do coke from Tuesday to Thursday. Well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so I do believe, and I know this is like a controversial take, but I do believe people can just like be recreational like heroin users. Like I believe that people can. Oh, I totally disagree. Well, th- that's fine, but I I think people can. Yeah. I I think that just somebody be, can. Well, somebody just, can. You've just never heard of anyone who can do it. Like I've met people who are like, yeah, you know, I do heroin every once in a while, and they and they don't We've do all it every heard day. Of Keith Richard. But I'm just saying that's like it is a real thing. <laughs> um, like people. I guess. You you just haven't met anyone who's done it. Like to say that's that true. to say that it's either it's black or white is is absurd. Um, because it never is. Agreed. So I, yeah. but to go back to your question of like, did I try to moderate? Of course. Um, we've, we've talked about this. I've shared about it where I yeah. am simply, I have relapses for a reason. And even before I came to recovery, I tried to, you know, moderate. I had a using journal, um, where I actually <laughs> took tr- like stock of, you know, each day I would write down everything that I used and some days were better than others. And I think it helped. We both know it was a spreadsheet. It wasn't a, it wasn't a journal. No, it was a journal. You had a, you, you had a, you had a cross reference spreadsheet. And it was I would have had a Excel spreadsheet. And... I would have had a spreadsheet now, but when I was 24, yeah. it was a journal. Um, yeah. but I mean, yeah, I, I tried and I, I don't think there was any harm in trying. I think it was good to try. No, um, no, no. Yeah. But you know, I've I've failed. <laughs> it just didn't work out for me, and yeah. it, it didn't work out for you. But I know people. And that's okay. I know people that it does work for. So that's really all that matters. And yeah. you know, it's um, yeah. My way is for sure not the only way, and I think that it's important Thank to God recognize that. that people, you know, can moderate. And that's a fucking, fu- yeah. it's fine. Like, you know, like, yeah. cause people will get all, uh, you know, on a soapbox and start yelling about their program. But again, it's your program. It's not everyone's program. Yes. yes. All right. So David, it, it is, it is about that time. It is about that time. It is. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. La- ladies and gentlemen, of uh, of the, the the podcast viewing audience, it is that time from France all the way to Baltimore to go to the Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yep. We'll just leave it at that. Yep. So so, uh, I mean, I guess by the time this episode comes out, it, it should be back around holidays, I guess. Um, so we'll ask we'll ask this question that's been on here for a long time. So this comes from Angela Dowling um, from Twitter, and her question is holiday survivor t- um, tips, which is I guess more of a topic. But the way this works is Chase, you'll you'll go first, then David, and then myself. Um, but this doesn't have to just be about recovery. I mean, how do you survive? You know, Great Aunt Lisa. You know, telling you that, you know, it's, it's about damn time you settle down. You know, what, how, how do you not listen to your uncle being a little racist at the table? So, um, Chase, go ahead. Oof. How, uh, how to survive the holidays? Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> I'm the wrong, I'm the wrong person to ask about that. Uh, lock yourself in your room and, and disappear. Um, my, my cousin has done yeah. that before, actually. <laughs> um, that's probably what I would do. Um, my goodness. Is this, I mean, is this specifically relating to, to alcohol though as well? Um, probably, probably. Sp- probably specifically related to alcohol, but I mean, we can go into like, sometimes the holidays are just hard, right? Yes. Because emotionally and like mentally, mentally, mentally and emotionally. Yeah, for I sure. mean, it can cause some feelings to come out, right? And those feelings can lead you, you to drinking. Those, Eric. Huh? You don't have those. Apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, I, I always know I always fall apart during the, the holidays no matter what. 
Um, God. Does it, I, yeah, I'm the wrong person to ask about this. I'm wondering if there's anybody out there who actually successfully gets through the holidays without being able to keep, uh, being able to keep the, the motions in check. Um, oh, yeah, I can't. I mean, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. We'll get yeah. into it. Okay. No, I mean, this, this sounds, this sounds stupid, but I, yeah, I, I honestly, like, I, I kind of, um, I, I try, I'm, I'm trying to like meditate my way, like through things right now. I know that sounds ridiculous and I sound like a, like a, no, it sounds great. I sound like a typical Californian, I think right now. Um, <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but yeah, that's been, I don't know that, that helps me just get through the day to day and keep the anxiety down. Um, being in quarantine as well, like, you know, physical, uh, physical fitness, working out, um, meditating. So getting through like very stressful times. Yeah. Like having those tools that you can go to, I think, um, could be really useful. And obviously, um, the holidays are extremely, extremely stressful and emotional. So yeah, I, I guess just having the little tools, those little things that, that can keep you at neutral, um, mm -hmm. like, as those as possible to get through, uh, uh, that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. I, I am somebody, uh, that, uh, will cry on, uh, around the holidays. That, that's going to happen. And sometimes it's like voluntary. Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll throw on, I'll throw on, uh, uh, it's a wonderful life. And y I think you have to, I think everybody should just put on, it's a wonderful life right, right around Christmas or new years. And just, just have a good cry. It, it's cathartic. It's good for you. That's fine. Um, so sometimes it is voluntary. Um, but, huh, what, it, actually, it, it's kind of interesting when you, when you talk about, is that your cat, Eric? Yeah, it's, I guess it's my pussy calling you a pussy. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a dick move. That's a low <laughs> blow, buddy. That's a low blow, buddy. I was wondering if okay. I was gonna, if I was gonna go there, but you know, I figured since you brought up the cat, you, you totally I just, did. I, I had you, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I had to. I threw a softball at you, and you had to swing. I got you. <laughs> um, no, my first uh, Christmas, like I was like thirty days clean, and where like the pumpkin pie is, is out and like somebody like hands me the ready whip and instantly the first thought in my head was take a whip it. Cause oh. that's what I've been doing for like a decade. Just like suck on the fucking uh, whipped cream can, get, get a little, uh, get a little buzz and go. And like, I actually had the nozzle up to my fucking my mouth and I was like, Ooh, this is a bad idea. I, I can't do this. So I had to stop myself. So that, that's like a little bit of a funny story. So uh, along those lines, if you're in early recovery and you, and you got the ready whip can out and that's your sort of thing, avoid it. Give somebody else the whipped cream. Tell them to put it on your pumpkin pie. Keep it moving. Um, <laughs> beyond that, um, if you're stuck in the house with difficult people, uh, Aunt Gertrude, Uncle Bill, whoever. Gertrude. It, 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 yeah, Gertrude, definitely. Or your your sisters or your brothers or your mom and dad who are paying the fucking ass and and, and make the holidays more difficult. Uh, distance yourself. Like, that's, a, that's all I can say is uh, is uh, pick your battles and, and, and uh, distance yourself to the best of your ability because a lot of those – there's a lot of people out there who just want to fucking antagonize you. And it always seems to happen around the holidays. Like, we have a sister – that it, it just r runs her fucking mouth and always wants to be a problem. And it, it's gotten to a point now where she's not welcome at the holidays. So that brings my next point. Like if you're out of the house and you're not around these family uh, members, you get to choose where you go and what you do for the holidays. Nothing's mandatory. You're an adult. Like if, if your parents are fucking assholes, you don't have to go over their house for Thanksgiving or Christmas. You don't have to. Like if your sister is a piece of shit or your brother is a piece of shit, don't invite them over. Like you're an adult. Like if, if there are unhealthy scenarios for you around those specific times, don't, don't volunteer for them. You don't have to. That's, that's my recommendation is, is know where you're at and ultimately choose 
your mental health and emotional uh, well-being over the quote-unquote status quo of, I should be with my family around the holidays. Because fuck that. You don't have to be around your family at the holidays. Is it nice? Sure. Is it mandatory? No, it's not. You're a fucking adult. and You can choose to be alone or with your friends or doing whatever you want to do to make the holidays the best for you. Can I say one more thing? Because I think you brought, you brought up like a really awesome point. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think mean, just like also uh, like accepting the fact that the holidays are like going to be a, a, like a rough time potentially. Yeah. Because I think people are so eager to, especially on social media, they're so eager to like show the world how much fun they're having and how close <laughs> oh, they're Oh, yeah. And how awesome like their their turkey is and their presents and how like perfect everything is. Mm-hmm. Um, you could easily trick yourself into thinking that like I you could compare yourself to those people and be like, oh, you know, I should be that. What's wrong with me if I if I'm yes. stressed out mm-hmm. in Christmas? But um, you know, I mean, people people um, try really hard on social media to portray a specific image. So I, I think for me, I just, no people so, never yeah. do that. <laughs> I've never There's had fake people on social media. Yeah. But just like for me being like, yeah, you know, holidays are coming up. Like, gotta, it might, it might suck. Um, mm-hmm. that, that goes a long way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Distance yourself from social media too. You need to take a couple weeks off from, from Christmas to new year's because you don't have that many people or you're having financial hardship and, and don't have all the presents and gifts, everything. And you're going to feel that, that fear of missing out or that, that just insecurity, just do what's best for you. Don't try and please everybody. Yeah. All right, Eric, how do you get through the holidays? You soulless fuck. God, so much, so much anger, David. Are you okay, David? Is everything okay over there? You swung first. You I, swung first. What are you talking about? You're talking, you're talking about crying. And, I mean, yeah. what was I supposed to do there? You know, I mean, you laid it out. I took Take it. Take the high road, Eric. Right? You're, you're supposed to be the mature one. I am the mature one, but I'm not. I'm still going to do the, uh, <laughs> you know, the easy, the easy. You're going to pick the low-hanging fruit. Yeah, man. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, just bite your tongue with, uh, like, the family. Yeah. Um, Suck it up. Yeah. It's, I'm uh, done. I have a busy, just from personal experience, I have a very busy holiday season. Uh, we have lots yeah, of, do. like, yeah, it's rough. <laughs> lots of family, um, which is great. It's cool. Like, you know, like it happens once a year, but it is fucking exhausting. Um, we do like four Christmases. It's, you know, it's like a fucking movie, but it's, um, it's, re- it actually is a movie. Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's rewarding. But it's very tiring and things come up where it's just like, it's like, oh, man, of course you guys are going to bring up politics. And it's like, no, I should just say that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, fuck, like I'm going to leave the room and go talk to these people. Um, yes. But I, from a recovery standpoint, there was a time where I didn't stick around very long. I can handle it a lot more now because I'm older and frankly, I just don't, Mm -hmm. I don't really give a fuck. Um, and it's like, I'm more there to enjoy myself than to cause trouble. But, you know, and honestly, like, no, not, not in this scenario. Um, but I mean, for Thanksgiving, it's like, I can just watch the game, you know? And, yeah. and half yeah. the Christmases, I can just watch the game. And, you know, if I can distract myself and still spend time with people. Ow, you fucking cat. Oh, my God, that hurt. <laughs> um, Karma's a bitch. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, that's all I would say is just, you know, don't feed in to other people's, like, issues and anger because you get yeah. to kind of like see everyone for you know a little bit more time than usual and in a very condensed setting um so just don't feed in to it you know try to try to be the better person mm-hmm. try to like you know take the high road but i know that it's hard so we aren't all perfect so sometimes we're gonna fuck up at that yeah 
Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like we're about out of time, so we would like to thank our uh, guest, Chase, for joining us today. Woo! Yeah! Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it was great having you, man. You, you, you had a lot of great great things to say, and we're, we're, we're happy to get your message out there. Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And um, mm-hmm. and Chase, yeah. do you do you want to uh, promote your website or anything? Uh, okay, uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I have a podcast that is called Stone Cold Moderation, and right. I am promoting either moderation for people who think that might work for them, or sobriety for people who think they are going to need to go alcohol free. And um, you can find my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you get your uh, podcasts. Um, my website is stonecoldmoderation.com. And you can also find me on uh, social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Make sure you go on to our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, our YouTube channel. For more information about Eric and I, go to podcastrecovery.com. Like, share, subscribe, invite your friends, come join us on the pod. But most importantly, everybody stay safe and stay clean.